With that, for those of you that don't know me, I am Leanne Skirpe. I oversee the 4-H Animal Science Program here at North Dakota State University, and I also am the Associate Chair for 4-H Youth Development. And I am so excited to introduce Walker today because I've known him for a couple of years now when I was down at the University of Florida, and I'm so excited that he's here tonight to talk to us about um, Claiborne Farms. So Walker, I'm going to go ahead and take my slides down and turn it over to you. Okay. Thank you, Leanne. Um, thank you for having me on. Um, I know Leanne, she from the University of Florida days. I uh, was there from 2008 to 2012 and majored in animal sciences uh, with a specialization in equine. So um, got to know her there. I graduated from the University of Florida in 2012. Um, and shortly thereafter, I went and worked at the uh, racetrack with a tr uh, horse trainer of ours. Uh, for the remainder of, of 2012. And then I, uh, there was a shakeup at the farm and I came back and I actually was our vet tech for a whole breeding season at, uh, at our farm in Paris, Kentucky uh, for the uh, year 2013. And then I, my dad was, he took over the farm when he was 22 years old after his dad abruptly passed away. And uh, I was thrown into the, to the chair and uh, been there ever since. Um, so, Lena, if you want to go to the next slide, we, uh, Claiborne Farm, we are a uh, thoroughbred operation in Paris, Kentucky. We have about 3,000 acres and we have about 100 uh, full time employees. My, uh, we actually started uh, as a horse farm in Virginia shortly after the Civil War. And we, uh, my great great grandfather started racing horses as a hobby. And then my great grandfather inherited some land from a, from a lady that he married and they decided to move the operation from Virginia to Kentucky in 1910. So I'm fifth generation horseman, fourth generation to run the family's farm. And here we are today and uh, we are a full scale uh, thoroughbred operation. We have about 180 foaling mares, 150 yearlings, about 40 maiden mares and 13 stallions, five teaser, five teaser stallions. And uh, not, we have about 60 of those mares would be our own. Um, and then the rest would be a lot of clients. We have clients from all over the country, California, New Washington, New York, Florida. Um, a lot of them have been here for generations, just like myself, uh, that my dad, and my grandfather cultivated the relationships and we're carrying on through today. So uh, we're very thankful to have such great, great uh, clients that uh, uh, support us. <clears throat> We, uh, a little bit about us, like I said, we, we do a little bit of everything in the horse racing industry. We have about 25 horses in training. Some notable races that we've won. We won the uh, Kentucky Derby in 1984 with Swale. Unfortunately, I was not around for that, but uh, <laughs> I wish I could have been. We're, we're still striving for that uh, next Kentucky Derby winner. And uh, you never know what, what, when it's going to come, but we're, we're trying every year. Uh, and most recently, we, uh, we had a horse named Blaine that won the Breeders' Cup Classic in 2010. That was when I was in college, and that was, I certainly remember that night. That was a lot of fun. He beat uh, Zenyatta, who was undefeated in her career up to that point. And he was a big, uh, a little bit of an underdog, but he he beat her that night and uh, in front of about 110,000 people. And it was like, uh, it was a moment I'll never forget. And uh, he is now standing as one of our stallions here at the farm. Um and he's one of my favorite horses of all time. He, he means a lot to me. I actually got to work with him a little bit as a yearling. And now to see that he comes full circle, that he's a stallion and see that his offspring is running on the track and having success at, uh, brings a lot of joy. And uh, it's a lot of fun to follow the career of his, his progeny. I bet that's something really neat to follow. Yeah. You know, yeah. So, right. Um, so we've been in business since 1910. I certainly can't take credit for, any of these accomplishments for the most part, but we've, uh, we've raised 10 Kentucky Derby winners. Six of the 13 triple crown winners have been conceived at our farm by our stallions over the years. We've led the sires list 29 times, 42 leading broodmare sires. Uh, over, we've raised over 300 champions, um, or sorry, we've sired over 300 champions, 17 horses of the year, 23 hall of fame inductees and 16 broodmare of the year awards. So the, um, goes back to 1910 when my great-grandfather uh, started here and 
Uh, it really uh, was my grandfather who who really moved the farm forward in the, like the uh, 1940s and 50s. He started importing a lot of European bloodstock um, shortly after the, the war. There was an, obviously a depression uh, after World War II, and he um, the, the horse racing industry over there was suffering. So he moved some stallions over here, and that really reinvigorated the industry here and, and brought a lot of new blood. And ever since then, um, you know, my my grandfather, and my my dad have done a great job moving the farm forward, and that's what I'm trying to do currently. Cool. So, like I said, we had a we have about 180 mares expected to foal this coming year. Um, it's obviously um, very busy from about the middle of February or middle of January to uh, about the middle of May. Uh, one night we might have. No mares full, and the next time we have seven. We have a uh, resident veterinarian that lives on the farm, thankfully, that, that's always there um, if, if there's any issues whatsoever. But we actually have a, uh, a guy that works on the farm. He's been here for over 50 years, and he foals all of our mares. And uh, we, I mean, he, his expertise and experience is unraveled, um, and he does such a great job, and we're so thankful for him and everything like that. Um, you know, we, uh, let's see, we have uh, 13 stallions. Uh, the breeding season runs from, we open our uh, breeding shed on Valentine's Day, and we actually end on July 4th. Cool. So um, once we're full of mares and once we're breeding stallions, it really gets um, crowded on the farm. There's a lot going on. There's never a dull moment. So, uh, yeah, we're, we're pretty quiet, thankfully, for the month of the uh, the rest of November and December, but about January 15th, once we start having a, some falls that we kick into high year and March and April is just crazy around here. So a lot, a lot going on. Mm -hmm. I can't even imagine. Uh, as I said, we have 13 stallions. Uh, they range in stud fees from 5,000 to 150,000. Algorithms is five, Blames 30, Catholic Boys 25, Demarche today is five, First Samurai is 15, Flatters 40, Ironicus is five, Lee's five, Mastery's 25, Orbs five, Run Happy's 10, Warfront's 150,000, and War of Wills, our new style, stallion this year. He just ran in the Breeders' Cup a couple weeks ago, and he, uh, his stud fee for 2021 is $25,000. Wow. Um, we don't overbreed our stallions. Uh, the most we breed is about 140 mares. Um, you know, it's right now um there's actually a, a new regulation that are, that's come down the pipeline that the jockey club has recently implemented and that starts in 2022 that um no horses from that age group and beyond will be able to breed more than 140 mares a year um because right now we're running into a little bit of a problem where some farms are taking advantage and they're breeding their stallions to 250 250 mares uh, or more and um, it's just not sustainable for the industry. It's creating a lot of inbreeding and soundness issues. Mm -hmm. So thankfully the Jockey Club has taken an initiative to um, hopefully stop that and diversify the gene pool, which we so desperately need. So the most we would breed, Mastery I think bred last year 141 mares. And that was the most any stallion will ever breed. We, we, likely, we like our stallions to breed about 115, 120. So. And Walker, uh, but, for you on the call that don't know about thoroughbreds, can you tell us a little bit about how the thoroughbred industry is a little different than, let's say, the quarter horse industry in terms of AI? Yeah, so uh, this they all require live cover. <laughs> so um, to be a registered thoroughbred, you have to be conceived via live cover. Um, that certainly takes a lot of a lot of effort, and um, uh, there's some. You know, that's, that's why we don't like to breed our stallions to a lot of mares because uh, their libido will drop. Um, we like, we think their longevity, incre longevity increases uh, when we manage their, their stud books. So um, we would be on the conservative side compared to many um, other commercial breeding farms. That's very cool. Sales, we, like I said, we just got done with our November sales. Uh, it's an open sale. Um, we had uh, we sold mares, foals. Uh, you can sell selling prospects and racing prospects. Um, we have the January sale coming up. It's also open. And then in the springtime, we get to our uh, our two year old sales. Um, they're mainly down in Florida and Ocala. 
we don't really consign much there, but we'll have a couple that we sell. And then September is our, our biggest um, uh, sale season. We, that's when we sell, sell a bunch of yearlings. This past year, we sold about 60. Um, our normal number is about 50, 55. So there's a lot of work that goes into that, uh, sales prepping leading up to it. Um, you know, and that's when we sell our majority of our crop. Um, you know, it, it takes a lot of <laughs> it's a lot of money to breed to these stallions and run on a farm that has 100 employees. Um, and that's when we make um, if a, a lot of our, you know, our money. So that, it's a very important time for us in September. I bet. <laughs> Um, tours, we, uh, we offer about tours, uh, seven days a week. Um, so if you're ever in, in the area, you'd love to come out. We'd love to have you out and, uh, see our stallion complex. We, uh, like I said, we have 13, 13 stallions and our, our stallion grooms do the tours. Um, they run at 10 AM and 11 AM and last we average about 10,000 visitors a year, um, from all over the country. People love, we have a lot of return visitors. They love bringing their family out and friends and showing them the farm. And uh, we're very, we're very open. Uh, we were one of the first farms to offer these tours and it's since caught on. There's some uh, initiative called Horse Country uh, in the Lexington area. And then it's a conglomerate of all farms. And uh, it's kind of the tour process is streamlined through it. And I'll be happy to answer any questions about that. But um, we're very proud of our tours. And we, we, that's our visitor center there that you see in the screen. There's a little merchandise area. You can um, watch some video, old footage of the, our stallions and race um, race footage. And, <clears throat> you know, it's um, it's fun. It's, we just built it a couple of years ago. We, um, you know, we, we felt that we needed to, to improve our, our uh, customer experience or, or tour experience. And uh, it's been a, a great success thus far. And I can definitely speak for the tours because I used to take my judging team there every year and they will show you the breeding barn. They'll take you out and show the stallions, uh, Secretariat's grave. And so really cool opportunity if you haven't been there. And Ryan actually has an excellent question. Welcome back, Ryan. Hey, he is asking, has COVID impacted your tours and visitors or how has? Yeah, yeah, it did. So um based off our governor's guidelines, we, uh, we had to cut tours. Um, we didn't offer, we stopped them in mid March and we didn't pick them back up until I think, uh, end of May. And we did 25%, I think for June and then like 33% for August. And then we, we've slowly opened it back up, but unfortunately there's new regulations now, um, that just happened. That's actually going to affect tomorrow. Uh, thankfully our tours are not, um, uh, it, 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 won't, it won't affect them because we've, we've been at 50 percent the whole time thankfully we can still be at 50 percent but uh our max tour can pass about 30 or 40 so we still have about 15 people a day that come through um and we love and we've really miss missing our visitors this this spring it's definitely odd um you know april and may are our busiest times of the year and there's the tours are full every day and uh it definitely was depressing not to see uh, and, and share <clears throat> share our experience and our, our stallions with with the public. I bet. Oh, there it is. Yeah. So, um, a lot of people love coming in on their tours to see Secretariat's grave. We get so many emails, and they people love sending him flowers, especially around the Kentucky Derby. Um, you know, on the date of his death, people will send it, or when he's born, they'll send it. So. Um, uh, he's just one of, of many of the headstones that you'd see in our graveyard that's by our stallion complex. Um, you know, we, these, these creatures are so good to us that we, I mean, we like to honor and respect them the best way that we possibly can. So that's part of the tour. Um, you know, recently, I, I think maybe a knock on the thoroughbred industry is aftercare. People always wonder what happened to them. But we have about 40 retired mate, uh, mares on our farm, uh, including geldings. And we always... Uh, we put notes on our jockey club papers if uh, we ever find one in the kill pen, which is rare, thankfully, but it does happen, unfortunately. Uh, we'll always take them back. And, um, you know, we, we always are looking out for our, our, uh, horses that we bred and always we donate to aftercare um, facilities. And then we actually have a 5K that we host every year in September um, and all the proceeds go to uh, um, aftercare facilities. So it's very important to us that we take care of the animals that bring us so much. 
I'm gonna have to bring my friend Lindsay on the call out and go join and do that 5k. Yeah. Love to have you. So, um, Leanne, you know, obviously we have an internship program. Um, I don't know the audience might, might, uh, be interested if there are any college students or whatever, but we do offer two internship programs. It's a great way to get your foot in the door we offer a reading season internship program from January to May and a sales internship program from June to September. And the breeding one, you'd learn how to, you see mares full, you'll learn how to full mares. You get a lot of experience um, with young foals um, that are just born, how to take care of them. And then the sales, you'll, we, we teach sales, you know, sales prep, we, like I said, our big sales in September. So uh, we start grooming our yearlings and preparing them. We have walking machines and we groom them and bathe them and teach them how to, uh, to, to stand out for clients and uh, do all that stuff. So it's, kind of two different um, spots of our business. And we also offer a vet externship. We have a resident veterinarian and he would love to have some help from um, wanting veterinarians that are just trying to uh, learn about the horse racing industry. That's really cool. All right. So that's about, that's a good brief overview. Um, I'd love to have, answer any questions that anyone that might, might have. Heck yeah. So I have a, f a few questions and we'll wait until they kind of field in in the chat box. So any question that you guys have, put them in the chat box and we'll get those fielded to uh, Mr. Hancock. Uh, we are always curious, um, you know, how on earth did you, obviously you're kind of in the family, but you didn't start out going into the horse industry. So tell us a little bit about your background. I know you kind of initiated that, that you were also at the University of Florida, but what was you know, you didn't, did you ever plan on being the president? Like, how did that kind of come about? No, you know, my dad told me at an early age, he's like, you know, if you don't want to do this, it's, it's something that you have to have a passion for and uh, you really have to want to do it. And if you think you're just going to halfway do something and you're going to try something, do something else first, you can't just come back and pick it up as a drop of a hat. So I actually started working when I was eight years old, the sales, I would rake, I would rake the, uh, the shed rows and you know just do the little things that I possibly could and uh actually there was like this really old mare that or not really old but there's this really easy going mare that uh, I was able to show when I was like eight years old so um but then I, I transitioned to you know I started at the bottom and I was weed eating the, the the fence rows and I was putting the hay and the straw in the barns started out when I was 13 and I've kind of worked my way up so it's actually a great great learning experience for me to see how the farm works from inside out. And, um, you know, my dad, uh, obviously is thrilled that I, I wanted to do it, but he certainly, he never, he, he never pushed it on me. And I think the, mainly because of that, I probably, uh, want, had more interest in, in the, in the business. Yeah, that's really good. We have a, a really good question. Um, is your internship paid or is it, uh, tell us a little bit more about maybe some of the things you offer to your interns. Yeah, it's uh we offer housing and it is paid. Um, it's obviously you know minimum wage or whatever, but uh, we view it mainly to get your foot in the door and get experience. It's mainly for people that are recently graduated college, but um, actually we've uh, placed a lot of people. Our interns, we always like to see them move along. One of our actually our assistant broomer manager was an old intern. Um, one of our stallion uh, uh, main stallion guys was an old intern. Um, you know, Troy, Leanne, he was our, one of our old interns and he's a manager at another farm. Oh, I didn't um, know that. A couple, yeah, a couple of farm managers um, that uh, went through our internship program. So we view it as, as like a, a great, great first step for people that maybe not, might not know a lot or want to at least experience and see what they might think uh, they might want to make a career out of it. That's really cool. So one of, I guess, the perfect questions kind of surrounding internships or any employees that come to work for you, what are some of the skills or qualities that you're looking for when hiring somebody? Uh, I like to see someone that's, that's dedicated and hardworking, um, you know, uh, show up, just do the little things, show up on time, you know, uh, just have a passion and, and have a reason to, to be here. It's, don't view it as just, uh, it's just a paycheck, you know, actually take care of the, you know, want to take care of the horses and, and build a bond with them. Uh, it's very important. We have a lot of generational employees here. Uh, 
we have actually a couple guys that have been here over 50 years. One of our, wow. our, uh, I mentioned the following guy earlier, but our assistant yearly manager has been here for 53 years. Wow. Um, a lot of our employees have, are lo very long tenured, 30, 40 year employees. And um, we have about 23 residential houses on the farm. I think that kind of builds a sense of community. It's very kind of a family oriented business here. And uh, we try and treat our employees just as good, if not better than our horses. <laughs> I love it. That's pretty cool. Uh, what is your favorite part about your job? Uh, I like how it changes from uh, month to month. I mean, like I said, I just got done with the November sale, but uh, right now it's kind of quiet, but you know, January, we're going to start following mares. In February, we start breeding our stallions again. Uh, March, there's the two-year-old sales. April, we have the race meet at Keeneland. The May, the Derby festivities, Triple Crown. June, it's just gorgeous around here with everything's in bloom and it's weather's, you know, so it's just something new every, every month. It's not um, go to work, do the same thing every day. It's, it's always a new challenge. No. <clears throat> All right, Vivian's got a good question here. Can you share a challenging time in your life when the horse business helped bring you through it? The horse business helped bring me through it. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess last year, um, there's a lot of negative publicity because of the, there's a lot of breakdowns at the Santa Anita racetrack in California. And um, I would say the race, the racing industry was really kind of in peril at the time. And uh, since then, we've all kind of came together and um, done what's really what's best for these horses and improved our track track maintenance. Uh, we've eliminated a lot of the drugs that were allowed. Uh, we've re we've really cleaned up the sport, and it's obviously an ongoing process. But yeah, I mean, at that time, it was a low point for me because I didn't know what else I would do if something had happened to the horse racing business. But thankfully, we all rallied together, and um, definitely we're on the up and up. So. Um, you know, I feel like this isn't necessarily my job. It's a, my lifestyle. So um, it's everyone takes it personally, and especially myself. So um, we, we, uh, we need to make it better in every facet possible. Mm -hmm. That's really good. Very nice. Very, very cool answer. So on the other spectrum, what is probably the least favorite part of your job, which you might have actually kind of covered it there, but. Yeah, um, that my least favorite part of my job is probably having to deliver bad news to our clients. Obviously when you're dealing with livestock, um, bad things are going to happen. Uh, mayor might not make it through foaling or a baby might contract pneumonia and pass or whatever. So I the, definitely the, the least, the most thing I dread is call, is making phone calls to clients because they love their horses so much. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's like losing a, a, a kid to some of them. So it's, it's tough on them. So that's definitely the hardest part of my job. Yeah, no, that totally makes sense. Is there a required degree or how do you look in terms of experience to enter into one of your positions or somebody in your field? Yeah, I mean, honestly, our inter internship program, you don't really need any experience at all. We, we, it's very open-ended and we keep it that way. So anyone that has the least bit of interest in the horse, bit, horse world wants to dive in and see what it's all about, we welcome that. Um, you know, certainly our grooms, we like to have yeah, a little bit of experience, but we'll certainly work with you. You know, uh, we have people every year that we hire that um, don't doesn't have much experience, and we'll put them with like the old old retired mares first, or the barren mare. You know, something simple that they can kind of get their feet wet, get comfortable around the horses, and then they can graduate to um, you know maybe some mares that are pregnant versus the mares in fold and the yearling stallions. So there's kind of a chain that we use, but yeah, you, you don't really need to have much experience to start. We'll, we'll take care of you and make sure you're not put in a bad, dangerous situation. That's really cool. That's always okay. nice. Definitely keep those questions coming in the uh, chat box if you have any more. So I've asked everybody this so far because I think it's really important. I have a lot of college students come to me and I have a lot of 4-H age youth that come to me and they often come with an, you know, maybe some self doubt is getting at them. Like, oh, I, I can't do that. I, I'm just going to fail at it. What kind of advice would you give to somebody if you've maybe had a part in your life where you've, you've failed at something, but you overcame it? What kind of advice could you give to those individuals? Uh, I mean, one of my personal mottos is just don't give up. I mean, you're going to fail. It's part of life. So um, don't make uh, mistakes it, it's not a mistake if you learn from it and that's what my dad's always told me so uh you know everyone makes mistakes but just learn from it and don't do it again um so you know it's it's important that you keep on 
keep on, um, you know, trying and, and keeping your head down and, and do the best you can. And, um, in the end that, that hopefully will, that, that will be enough. Mm -hmm. I love that. That's so good. Um, I know you talked a little bit about kind of the jobs and the housing and feeding the people just as well as the horses. Is there anything that you can tell me a little bit about some of like, if somebody's listening on this call and they're interested in coming to like that wants, they want this to be their lifestyle. What can they expect in terms of either salary ranges, benefits? Um, what kind of things could they get or look forward to for that? Yeah, we offer our, our employees full benefits, health care, dental, uh, eye, whatever, <clears throat> whatever they need, uh, match their 401k, all that good stuff. So we, we really try and take care of our employees because we know how important they are. Without them, we couldn't take care of all these horses. So uh, like I said, we have, we have residential houses. That's always kind of something that people like to work up to. It's, you know, they don't really have neighbors. You get to live on a beautiful farm and, and you know live your life but yeah a, a groom you usually start out um 30 35,000 a year or so and uh you know you can work your way up to a foreman to a manager uh you know managers are 50 plus and then you know farm managers vets senior management's you know 100 100 plus so um it's that's the great um lifestyle that you get to live uh my dad's always say you know we even if you're a groom, you, you might not be the richest person, but you'll have a great lifestyle because we'll take care of you. You get to work with horses, you get time off, you get to raise your family, you know, um, it's, uh, we like to think that we, we offer that, uh, lifestyle for people that, that like to want, want to work with our horses. It's really cool. I love that. You guys do, uh, do an amazing job on your farm. I know that's for sure. So you obviously had probably been down to Florida when you moved down there to go to school at the University of Florida, but what would you maybe give some of the young adults watching this in terms of maybe they've never left North Dakota and they want to go intern or work at your place? And that's kind of a scary thing, move into a new location, new weather, <laughs> new everything. What? What would you kind of tell somebody that kind of has to go um, away from home for the first time? I mean, we usually have about three or four interns that do the program every year. So uh, each program, so you won't be the only person doing it. Uh, you'll be, in, you'll be doing it with a few others. Uh, and, you know, through that bond, there's, uh, heck, there's a girl, I think she was from Washington a couple of years ago. Another girl was from Colorado and another girl was from Iowa. Now they're like, there's like three best friends you could ever have. So they didn't know each other beforehand. So, but they're all were interns at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I know that's a big step, but uh, like I said, we provide the housing. We'll take care of you. We try to introduce you to, to people that uh, the best we can. There's uh, usually if you're here for the breeding one, we'll let you go, you know, we'll give you the uh, day off at, and go to Keeneland so you can witness the race, the horse races firsthand. And so we really try and, and, um, and, and introduce um, our younger people and interns uh, the best to the industry the best way we possibly can. Oh, I love that. That'd be so cool. I guess, yeah, coming on whatever time of the year, man, there's a lot to do there. So you could experience almost everything. How long is your internship? Uh, the, the breeding one is from January to May or June. Okay. Uh, and the sales prep one is from about June to September. But We'll work with people. Um, if people, if um, you're in school or need to go back to school or you can't start until a certain date, we certainly understand that. We want to make make it uh, um, fit for you the best that we can, and uh, we love, you know, helping young people out and getting them exposed to this great, uh, great horse world that we're so blessed to be a part of. Okay. That's really cool. All right, Vivian, really good question. What does a normal day look like for you, Walker? Uh, so I get up about five, five thirty every day during the falling season. I'll go to the falling barn first thing and see if we have any new foals, uh, meet with our farm manager at 6 AM every morning, make sure there's no surprises overnight. No one colic had to go get sent to the, um, hospital. Um, so make a plan for the day, um, handle any internal issues or whatever, like I said, hundred employees. Um, there's, he does a great job of managing that. So, Anyway, um, and then like this time of year, uh, I was on a, on a phone call with a client most of the afternoon today talking about who they're going to breed their mares to and talking about stallions and their budget, what they want to spend and stuff like that. So 
you know, it, it really is a, a day to day thing. You know, the last two weeks I've been at the November sale, uh, they sold, you know, 3,500 head of horses and, uh, we sold about 60 or so ourselves and, and that's definitely a process. We bought a few, so, uh, busy there. Before that, we had the Breers cup and the lead up to that, uh, which is the world championships for thoroughbred racing. Um, which is a lot of fun. If you ever get an opportunity to go to the Breers cup, uh, it moves around the country. So maybe one day it'll be close to you wherever you are, but, um, I know next year it's in California. Um, but it's, it's, it's a, it's the best horses running, running against each other. And it's, it's basically the Super Bowl of horse racing. So it's always a great time and, uh, the atmosphere and the buzz and energies it's, it's, it's electric. That is really cool. I know I was actually at the race with Blame and Zenyet and I will never forget that day. It was so cool. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I guess it's not really a good answer what I do, what my everyday looks like, but it really just depends on the season. Yep. No, that's a good answer. All right. Caitlin has a great question. She's wondering what kind of precautions you might have been taking or are taking for the COVID pandemic to keep your staff safe. So we have about, uh, we have one person in each barn, essentially. Um, you know, if we were outside, thankfully, so um, it's, it's not too big of an issue. Um, but people are smart. Uh, you know, we, we told people to keep their distance if they go around people to obviously wear a mask. They, um, the drive, we usually have like, they hop in vans together, but now they're driving their own cars. Um, so that's changed a little bit. Um, but, you know, eh, thankfully we are outside and it has it, it, that that helps to some extent uh certainly in our office we've had to reduce our in office schedules we've staggered some people coming in some people just come in certain days not um every day so um we've taken precautions there like i said we've reduced our tour capacity um we wear a mask if we're talking to somebody uh, in close proximity uh, especially inside so um, thankfully we haven't had any issues here on the farm. Um, people have taken it in stride and understand the seriousness of the, of the um, virus. That's really good. Thanks for asking that Caitlin. All right. Until we get another question, I have another great question for you and you can say this in terms of, um, like just you personally, or even, you know, again, as an employer, accepting an employee, if I were to say first impressions, how would you explain that? Or how important is that to you? Uh, to me, it's, a, it's very important, especially appearance. You know, uh, when I meet someone, a new employee for the first time, um, you know, it, it, I, I, I certainly would give people second chances. I am a believer in that, but uh, I think it's very important to always be professional and, um, um, you know, treat every day as a job interview. Um, you know, you never know people, people, I, th I think kind of lose the fact I, we're always watching, um, you know, if you, whatever you say, whatever you do, um, you never know if a manager leaves who we might need to replace that with. We always like to hire internally too. So, um, you know, we, we're always watching our, our employees and evaluating them. So, um, always be on your best behavior and, uh, do the best you can. Yeah, that's really good. Um, great wisdom shared. It's just, it's interesting. Everybody's perspective and they always share such good wisdom on, you know, just tips and tricks as these young adults go out into the industry to be professionals. So it's fun. All right. Yeah. We have another good question here. What kind of horses do you have? So you talked about thoroughbred horses. Are those the only kind of horses that you have? Yeah, so they're all thoroughbreds except our teasers. Our teasers, uh, we have a little Rocky Mountain uh, teaser. That's our stallion uh, teaser. Uh, we have an uh, Appaloosa. Uh, we definitely have a mixed breed uh, horse. I don't know what he is. So <laughs> no, we, we definitely have uh, we definitely have a couple other uh, breeds of horses, but they're mainly just our teaser horse stallions. So for those of them on this call that might not know what a teaser is, can you tell us what it is and why you would use one of those? Yeah. So like I said, we have about 200 or so mares that we need to check to try and get in full for the funk next year. And he can't just sit there and palp every single one of them. So what our broodman managers will do, they'll bring a teaser stallion into the barn and they'll run them by the stall. If the mare is showing um, estrus, then they'll mark her down and the vet will check her later that day. 
Um, if not, they'll just keep moving. <laughs> it's pretty clear if one's, if one's, if one's coming up or not. Um, but so we use our teaser stallions to kind of gauge, um, interest when they need to be bred and, and, uh, they're a vital part of our, our, um, our business, especially the, uh, the, the stud barn teaser. I mean, um, before we bring in our, our stallions, um, <clears throat> we'll put a shield on our, our teaser down there, especially, a, a or actually a maiden mare that's never been bred before. And we'll have to jump her to, uh, you know, a lot of horses never had another horse on their back. So, um, if we're front, our big stallion gets kicked, uh, and is out of commission for a couple of weeks, that's a big financial hit to, to the syndicate. So we can't take that rest. So we, we have a teaser stallion that tests to make sure that the mares are actually receptive to a stallion. And then, uh, if so, we'll, we'll bring in the, the, the big boy. <laughs> That's very cool. That's perfect answer. Um, I know a lot of uh, individuals might not be well tuned to reproduction and that's a big part of who you guys are in terms of stallions and stuff. And maybe um, since you kind of hit on it today in terms of talking to somebody, maybe tell us a little bit about, you know, what you do in terms of when a client calls and you got to help them figure out because that's a huge part in terms of genetics. Like how do you breed what to who like that's a huge factor and um you know a, a big decision for your clients yeah i mean what i like to do first um pedigree certainly plays a, a large role but i like to look at the physique of the mare versus uh maybe the stallion that they want to use um if a mare might have some short legs i might recommend a stallion that that maybe would throw some leg into the offspring and and balance it out um, and make the most athletic uh, horse uh, possible. Um, you know, you might have a, a mare that needs a, a horse with a strong hind leg because she has a straight, she's straight through her hocks or something like that. So, um, you know, you try to identify a, a stallion that does that. Obviously, there's a price range. Stallions can range from 2,500 all the way up to 225,000. So um, you need to have a budget. Um, you need to know what you're looking for. You know, if you, if your mare is just a sprinter and you want to maybe try and add some distance and, and, uh, stamina to her, you, you know, you need to look for a stallion that, that can get you that. So there's obviously, uh, there's also Nick, uh, reports that you can run. There's, there's a whole website dedicated to, um, uh, they look at pedigree crosses from multiple generations and they'll analyze it and give you a letter grade of what the potential offspring could possibly be. Um, and like a dosage index, they call it, um, at the, at how, and basically it tells you how, how, um, uh, a multiplier, basically how much better the horse could be from average. So, um, there's plenty of tools that you can use, but, um, uh, to each his own to kind of which way, which one you, you kind of rely on the most. That's really cool. I guess I didn't realize there's, uh, um, some of those programs out there, which makes sense to utilize. Yeah. There's whole pedigree analysis. There's companies that that's their sole job is to analyze mares and, and recommend stallions to the, to the breeder. So, um, that's definitely a business within itself. Okay. <clears throat> In fact, Caitlin at poses a good question here. Do you have any way to measure your genetic traits on a quantitative level? Um, there's certainly programs that do, um, like I said, there's doses indexes that, that analyze inbreeding on stallions to the mares. Um, but it's, it's not like the cattle industry where, or the pig industry. I don't know much about that, but, um, where there's like, you know, uh, when you breed this bull to this heifer, this is what's going to happen or whatever. So, um, I, I would say the third bed industry is maybe a little, uh, at least the breeding aspect is not advanced in those terms. Um, just cause there's so much, I feel like variability, um, into what you're going to get. Um, but no, there's, there's not to answer that. I guess the short answer to that question. Right. I mean, you guys keep all of your racing indexes and stuff, but I'm not sure you'd have a far better idea than I ever would in terms of, you know, when you say you're tracking the offspring to really evaluate, you know, is Warfront's offspring, um, specifically correlated to maybe this mare and this mare, they're doing really, really well. So that's a really good fit. Some yeah, I mean, there, there's definitely like Warfront Nick uh, matches better with like, say, uh, the AP Indy line of mares versus the Stormcat line of, or whatever. So there's definitely um, 
some genetics that you can compare it to. Um, but <clears throat> as far as qualitative numbers, there I don't. There's not really anything that people put on um, a stallion versus in a mare. Very good question. Let's see, what other questions do you guys have? I think I already asked you about other skills because I mean, in your, as a farm, you've got so many different options and so many different fields of work that can really be there on your location. So, um, you know, the skill sets are very widespread for sure. Mm -hmm. And like you said, he, um, and just to reiterate for those on the call, he, you know, Walker mentioned, you don't have to have experience. He's going, because one of my questions on here is what kind of training comes with the position. And you already mentioned that you are, you keep your employees safe and those that are come to work there and you'll train them up and, and kind of teach them what they need to know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, we offer an internship program, but there's also something called Kimmy, which is Kentucky equine. Uh, uh, I can't remember what it stands for, but it, there's a, there's a whole internship program that the, um, that's run through uh, this organization and in, in uh, based in Lexington. So they'll place people on different farms um, that produces a lot of um, interns every year. I know there's like 20 or 30 a year, uh, male, female of all ages. So um, that's also something to look into um, if you just, if you want to maybe broaden your horizons. Mm -hmm. That is a really good point. I have heard of that program. Uh, thanks for bringing that up. Uh, Caitlin poses a great question. Do you take interns from another country? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we, like I said, we offer housing. Uh, you know, we are stationed here in Paris, Kentucky. It's only a town of about 10,000. So uh, housing might be a little hard to find, but we have a, a, a house just solely uh, dedicated to our interns. That's about two minutes away from our farm um, that uh, we'd love to house anyone that's wanting to work. That's perfect. That works out great. Very cool. Well, this is exciting. I love all these questions and it's been fun even uh, hearing a little bit more. I'm assuming that that was the last slide. Yep, sure was. I'm going to yeah. stop sharing here. Ooh, Ryan, great question here. What is your feeding program? <laughs> uh, so we use hallway feeds. We have a contract with them um, and they tailor our feed program based off uh, each horse's kind of nutritional needs. Um, we use a feed called like prep 14 for <clears throat> our yearlings. Uh, you know, it have more protein and fat that they need, uh, as the mares, uh, go through their different trimesters, um, they'll get, receive different feeds. Once they're, um, once they fold, they'll get mare pellets. Um, you know, some mares might get a supplement that if they need to produce, start producing more milk. Um, our farm, our, our farm managers, our farm manager and broodmare manager will monitor that. Um, as we're prepping for the sale, uh, we'll use like a little prep feed that adds a little more muscle um, to our to our yearlings. Um, so yeah, it, it really at each age group there's, they get different feeds. That's a good question, Ryan. Uh, and we our... feed us. Uh, sorry, we feed yeah. bluegrass bedding too. Um, we 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 stall our yearlings on bluegrass bedding and our mares on straw, but they get a mixture of uh, Timothy and alfalfa <clears throat> and um, our stallions, depending on who they are, they'll get a uh, different mixtures as well. You totally just read my mind because I was actually going to talk about bedding. So can you describe yeah. blue bluegrass bedding to them? Bluegrass bedding is literally the grass that grows here in the fields. We'll, uh, in the springtime, our, on our, in our unused pastures, we'll grow it up and we'll cut it, we'll bale it, and that's what we'll use to put our yearlings on. And it turns out we really don't need to feed them much hay. They, if you have hay in the, their stall and they're on their bluegrass bedding, they'll usually just eat the bedding and not the hay. <laughs> um, it's kind of what they're turned out on. We, we like to turn out our horses as much as possible. Um, right now, up until about December 1st, our horses will be out um, all night long. Uh, but starting this, December 1st, our mares will come back into the barns and go under lights, um, whereas our yearlings will stay out 24-7. Um, and since we are talking about lights, what are those lights used for, Walker? Uh, it starts their, it, it kind of jump starts their estrus cycle. Um, you know, they're long day breeders, so they need to um, get in the routine of uh, the breeding seasons around the corner and they, their, their in, insides need to um, kick into gear. <laughs> <laughs> That's definitely the short answer. Very well done. 
Uh, Caitlin has That's a, a non-scientific answer. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> you, you, you can provide them with a scientific answer. <laughs> nope, that was a good one. Um, Caitlin has another good question here. Um, talking about breeding traits. So what kind of breeding traits do you look for? And what would be a perfect racehorse? Uh, what would a perfect racehorse contain in your perspective or your eyes? A uh, perfect racehorse to me can carry speed around two turns. If you can do that, you'll win a lot of races. Um, you see it more and more. It seems like a horse will go to lead and, th and then they can lead the horse around and not get tired. That They're, they're going to be the winner. So what that usually takes is obviously stamina and speed. It's a, a rare combination that only few horses have every year. <clears throat> and that's who usually wins the Derby and the Breeders' Cup and all that stuff. So uh, we're always trying to – to breed that, um, you know, I think you, um, the mares are very important. They're half your herd. A lot of people just want to focus on stallions, but it's really important that you have a solid mare, um, that can produce uh, top quality offspring. And, um, you know, we, we always try and have big, strong mares around here. Um, that classic, classic distance looking mares. Cause you can always, you can, you can alter the speed and, and stamina with, depending on the choice of your stallion. But I feel like, um, to me personally, the mares have to, to carry um, just as much, if not more, than the stallions do. Yeah, that's a great answer, Walker. Love that. Um, and so since we're kind of talking about breeding, you know, some uh, breeding, like quarter horses, they use <laughs> brands and freeze brands and stuff. And some of them use tattoos. What do you guys use in the thoroughbred industry? We actually have microchips. Yeah. So when they're about uh, four months old, um, they'll get a little tiny microchip. that's like the size of so tiny that it goes right in the neck. And um, that was just implemented a couple of years ago. And now when they go to the racetracks, they just, they have a scanner and they scan their neck. They used to do lip tattoos on the upper of their lip, but that's kind of um, starting to phase out. Um, and uh, everyone has gone and we've gone towards the little microchips. Very cool. Yeah, the tattoos often get hard to read every now and again. So. Mm -hmm. Yep, they're very cool. That's exciting. Kind of a, it's kind of neat hearing how the thoroughbred industry continues to take on new technology and and is okay with change um, from such a historical background. It's, it's yeah to see where they go. Yeah, we're slow to change, but um, hopefully, new generations trying to embrace more technology and and change things quicker. Right. That's really cool. Any other questions from uh, those on the call? You guys have been doing a great job of, of bringing forward some questions. I love that you talked about the bedding because I remember going to Florida and seeing somebody that um, used peanut hulls as bedding. And mm -hmm. that was the first time I'd ever seen that, but a great way to recycle and use a resource. Yeah. Yeah. yeah now they have like cardboard bedding and all that, you know, recycled box boxes and stuff like that we haven't gone that route but <laughs> man, the horses seem to like their bluegrass bedding quite a bit i bet can you maybe tell us why you guys use straw in your brood mares versus shavings um it, it kind of just on especially falling mares um you know yearlings they're not going to really pick up much in a in a um in their bedding that can affect obviously they're not pregnant so they're not they you don't have to worry about abortion or, or miscarriage or anything like that where i think our falling mares we, we want to make sure that um there's nothing that any disease they can pick up you know it's so important once they have their full uh, it seems like straw is a little cleaner than maybe a bluegrass bedding uh you don't want the fold to pick up any sort of infection or um weird gunk that they can make them sick so uh that's that's why we use that very cool. Mm, got some good, good wisdom to share with these guys. I know um, a lot of times some people, you know, use straw for livestock, but they haven't seen it actually in a horse barn before. So mm -hmm. it's very good. Well, I guess if we don't, oh, yep. We got another question here. Let's see. How do you manage your pastures? Oh, that's a good question. And what grasses do you have? That's a really good question. Thanks, Caitlin. Uh, we have a lot of bluegrass, um, you know, uh, it's kind of what we're known for here in Kentucky. Um, it's definitely a mixture. And we have a lot of clover that comes through, um, in the cooler weather. So we, we definitely need to monitor, you know, 
when that, that clover is blooming in the late spring and the mares just get all saliva coming out of their mouth. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, you, you want to be a little careful. You don't want to get too, too fat. Um, <laughs> we definitely have a couple of mares on the farm that just will eat until they're, they can't anymore. <laughs> uh, but you know, we have a lot of, we, we do, uh, we, we chain drag our pastures twice a year. Uh, we take soil samples uh, in the spring and the fall and see if we need to add any nutrients or anything we can do to, to make them better. Um, every, we try and rest our pastures the most, uh, as much as we can. Certainly we don't want to overgraze or, or get them uh, tried down. So we grow them, I think maybe a little longer than some people do. Uh, we have, I mean, our smallest pasture is probably about 20, mm, about 15 acres. So, and our biggest is about 45. So, I mean, we, we try and have huge fields and don't uh, overcrowd overcrowd our fields. I'd say that would be the, the most important thing that we do. Very cool. Um, another question was, uh, is it, do you have any fields that are irrigated? No, no irrigation. We're not that fancy. <laughs> we rely on mother, mother nature. Uh, certainly this past year, uh, got pretty dry in the late fall or late summer. We were about to have to start feeding hay, but thankfully we got some rain and it kind of came back. But, you know, uh, dog days of summer, it can get pretty brown and dry. And uh, we just hope that it, some, it it does rain. And But no, we don't. We don't irrigate our pastures. Very cool. Um, Cindy, welcome. So glad you're joining this call. It has an excellent question. Um, biosecurity. What does biosecurity look like and how do you navigate through that and manage that? uh so our vets that's a <laughs> that's a vet question um he you know he's in charge of all that stuff we we do um vaccinate our our horses uh as needed um you know um they get all the proper dewormings and vaccinations that, that um is standard very cool i'm i imagine uh you guys kind of have any sort of quarantine and whatnot. You're not going to bring a brand new horse out on and just dump them out in your pastures with all of your other brood mares and stuff like that. Yeah. If a new, like, uh, there's some mares that clients bought from the sale the past couple of weeks and we have a barn that's dedicated to that. We'll leave them there for 30 days before we introduce them to the rest of the mare population. We actually have some mares that are going over to Europe to be bred, um, here around Christmas time. They're in quarantine right now. So, that barn's very uh, clean and, and tidy, and uh, we have to be careful, you know, keep them away. Double fence rows must be between each one so they don't take anything over with them. So that's pretty cool. Uh, speaking of traveling, because I imagine some people don't even know that you can put a horse on a plane. Um, so, do you guys have your own plane that you guys ship, or is that you have a contract or anything? Yeah, there's a contract. Merson is, is who we use, uh, they have a plane. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll put them in quarantine and then take them to the airport, but then they take it from there. Very cool. That's really cool. Um, what about bird or rodent problems? Yeah. Cause that can be a, also a, a biosecurity issue too. Yeah. The, the rodent problem is, is real. Um, <laughs> um, you know, it's, we, we try and take care of it the best we can, but it is a farm. We have 3000 acres. Um, you know, we, we, have people come once a month and try and exterminate the, the rodents best we can. There's certainly possums, raccoons that we try and manage, um, take care of, you know, it's, I hate that, but they, they obviously carry EPM, which is devastating to a horse, mm -hmm. um, that we have to be careful of. Uh, we have Canadian geese that migrate through us and we try and make sure they don't land in the fields and congregate and, you know, kind of just shoo them away and, and then move them along. So that's an issue, but, you know, and we try and keep our, our, our barns as nice as possible. You know, don't feed too early, you know, make sure you put the feed in right when the horse goes in because you don't want birds landing in there and eating the oats out of it and, and using the bathroom and the feed tubs and stuff like that. So, you know, it's, we try and are, are very conscious of, of those kind of issues. Yeah. That's a really great question, Cindy. I imagine uh, they're in a little bit warmer weather. I mean, does it, uh, you guys get ice storms? Does it snow much where you're at? Uh, it'll snow a couple times a year, usually not very significant. But yeah, ice storms are the worst for us. Mm -hmm. That's what I thought. Very cool. Great question, Cindy. Thanks for asking that. Biosecurity can be such a, a huge thing um, for any 
livestock animal. Any other questions from you guys? You guys have done a really good job getting some questions in there. Is there anything else that you care to share with us, Walker, before we let you have the rest of your evening? <laughs> no, just thanks for having me. You know, you can follow us on uh, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, Claiborne Farm, at Claiborne Farm. Um, we'll post some, Twitter is kind of more for racing. We'll post some racing updates and stallion updates there. And Instagram's good for uh, pictures and everything like that, certainly. And Facebook was all encompassing kind of tour information and all that stuff. So follow us on social media and we hope uh, you all can come and visit us if you're ever in central Kentucky. Yeah. They have some adorable baby photos on Instagram. So <laughs> love watching those come through yeah. breeding season. Well, thank you again, Walker, for your time and kind of sharing with us. We really appreciate all of your wisdom and the feedback just for our youth to kind of gain in terms of perspective for your industry, because it's a pretty amazing industry. So oh, thank you. Yeah. If you if anyone has any further questions, let Leah know and she can direct them to me. And absolutely you, um, love, love for anyone and everyone to get involved as much as they can. Yeah. With that. We will see you guys later on the last one on November 24th. Thank you again, Walker. Have a fantastic rest of your night. Thank you, Leanne. Thank you, guys. Bye.